And I think any of us that are uh, believers, any of us that take seriously the Word of God and are seeking to live by the Word of God, we recognize that uh, we're moving into a time that is far more antagonistic. Uh, maybe now it is manifesting itself in, in uh, say, social issues, where if we take the Bible seriously, if we take uh, what uh, the Word of God says and just kind of understand it like a child and take what it's obviously teaching, we're standing against the flow of uh, culture. And it's just a matter of time before uh, they'll not only want to disagree with us about the application of our faith, they're going to actually disagree with us about having that faith who the key person is of that faith, Jesus Christ. And so all of that just kind of brings up a, uh, an interesting question. How do we respond? How do you respond to people who are antagonistic about you living out your faith? Uh, another way of putting it is, how do you fight? Or are we even supposed to fight? Well, this was written about uh, 70 or... 80 years ago by a famous preacher of a previous generation. He actually finished his career, ministry career, being the chaplain of the Senate I'm, uh, of the United States. Uh, I'm pretty certain they would not have someone like him as the chaplain of the Senate anymore, but, uh, you know, we do have a God of miracles. But anyway, this is what he wrote. He said, there's many ways to fight. You may fight with your fists, but really, what does that prove, even if you win? It certainly doesn't prove that you were right. It just proves that you have more muscle and maybe can duck a punch, or maybe that you've got a harder head. In fact, chances are the guy who uses his fists to fight, he knows he's wrong. That's why he resorts to muscle instead of brains. He bluffs his way through life with a strong arm instead of intelligence. A man may fight with words, even win the argument. But again, what does that prove? Except that he's smarter with the king's English. This went written before there was a queen, so that's why I know it's written 70, at least 70 years earlier. He's more adept at language. Or maybe it just proves that he's got a louder mouth. No, love is the way to fight. Love is a mighty force. It's the mightiest force in history. Now, this does not always mean that love never loses. In fact, it often loses in the short term. But it always wins ultimately. Jesus loved and they did put him on a cross, crucified him like a common criminal. The man who fights with love must be prepared to lose, at least temporarily. But he'll be invincible in the long run. But he must be willing to suffer setbacks. That's why, really, only strong men can fight with love. Weak men, they don't, they don't love because love requires strength. It requires courage. It requires fortitude. Weaklings have to use their fists or arguments or guns, but they're really no match for love. Love outlasts anything. Now, I wanted to bring that up and read that to you. Because in a way, that kind of illustrates and summarizes what we're going to look at today. Now, I've asked you to turn to Romans 12 because what we're doing is we are taking this fall to look at what uh, the Apostle Paul said should be our response to the salvation that God has given us. Romans 1 through 11 are this incredible, detailed explanation of the salvation we have through Jesus Christ and then you get to chapter 12 and it's kind of the so what what do you do with that 
Okay, Richard, you've been saved by Jesus Christ. You've got peace with God. There's no condemnation. There's no separation. What are you going to do with that? And Romans 12 starts the practical section of the book, and he says, well, you know, basically I'll sum it up. You're to present your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. If you're here today as a, as a believer, as someone who is a recipient of the salvation that Jesus Christ bought for us on the cross of Calvary, if you, when, you took salva when you took communion here a little bit ago, you were taking it as a genuine believer who really has Jesus as his substitute and really does have that forgiveness. The appropriate thing for you to do is to, to live your life a sacrifice to God. Well, what exactly does that mean? Well, the rest of the chapter and the, the next couple chapters deal with some specifics, and we saw that. You're to give the body of Christ, the church, a full measure of service. And then we're in this section here where he says you're supposed to love unhypocritically. What in the world does that mean? Well, look at chapter 12, verse 9. Chapter 12, verse 9, he says, Let love be without hypocrisy. And we talked about that last week. Uh, you know, what he was saying there is you don't have to fake that love. Now, he's obviously, we talked about this too, he's, he's talking about genuine, authentic love. He's not just talking about the, the shivers or the goosebumpy feelings love. He's not talking about some infatuation. He is talking about, the, in fact, he used the word agape, agapao. This unconditional love that loves in action and attitude. And the feelings sometimes have to follow. Sometimes they might proceed, sometimes they may follow, might they, sometimes they might be simultaneous. But, but my love for my wife, my children, for you, for others, isn't supposed to be dependent upon how I feel. It's supposed to be dependent upon me living out the love of God that was totally lived out through Jesus Christ. That's loving unhypocritically. In other words, I'm not a fake. I'm not a poser. I'm not an imposter. I mean, you know, there's only, you know, it's terrible when someone's, you know, being all loving towards you, and you know they, they, they're faking it. They're an imposter, they're a poser, it's all this sappy, sweet garbage. And you know, I mean, there's you know, the, you know what's the only thing that's worse than that? When you reflect back on your actions and you realize, I was the imposter. In that situation a couple hours ago, in that thing yesterday, and I was all sappy sweet. I mean, I might as well have been saying, I hate your guts. Because I don't love you. I'm still ticked at you. I'm still mad at you. I'm still angry at you. I'm still whatever at you. I mean, it's horrible when someone's loving you and you know they're faking it. But like I said, the only thing worse is when I'm loving you. And maybe at that time or maybe a little later, it's like the Holy Spirit starts speaking to me and, and he says, Richard, you are a fraud. You're just a hypocrite. And the thing that's really terrible about it is, now I know it, but I'm smart enough to know that the person that I was fake loving at the time, they knew it in real time. They knew I was just garbage. He's doing this because he's paid to do it. In my case, you're doing it for some other reason. So whatever. Paul says... That, that's not how it needs to be and that's not how it should be. Let love be without hypocrisy. And then as if you looked at that passage, he just goes off and he starts giving point after point after point after point. I mean, we could do a, like a 15-part survey series of messages on every one of these things because there's so much here. But what we tried to do is kind of divide it up and it seemed like these first several verses were loving people inside this room loving people in the church loving hypocritic uh, loving unhypocritically the people in the church 
And that's what we all looked at last week. You know what we're going to look today? We're going to talk about loving the people out there. We're going to talk about loving, generally speaking, the people that are out there that might be taking issue with us, that might be crossing us. Now, like I said last week, I mean, this isn't a hard and fast division. Uh, maybe these are the people that are supposed to be out there, <laughs> but in reality, they're in here too. Okay, so some of this stuff happens out there. And one of the things that I, I've noticed as I've worked my way through it, it, it's like a lot of this that he lists there, starting in verse 14, is our responses, our reactions. They do something, and we show our love by how we react, how we respond. And, and just to put a label on it, he is calling us to respond to unbelievers, people outside, and really he's calling us to respond to everyone, like Christ would respond. Now you're going to see, if you're familiar with it, you're going to see a lot of parallels, a lot of connections, a lot of similarities to the Sermon on the Mount. Remember Jesus did, gave the Sermon on the Mount? It's in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Starts off with the Beatitudes. Blessed are these people, blessed are those people, blessed are these other people. And then he starts going through and kind of redefines righteousness. And then he gets into that portion about, hey, someone asked you to do something, do even more. Someone hits you, turn the other cheek. Well, look at it. Look at verse 14. That's where we are. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and curse not. Now, let's just think about that. What does it take to persecute someone? Uh, what, what do you have to feel, just humanly speaking, to want to persecute someone. I mean, number one, you, you totally disagree with what they're doing, with what, they're, what they are, what they're, what they're preaching, what they're promoting. There's disagreement, but I mean, there's tons of people I disagree with, but I'm not about to go persecute them. I mean, what does it take to get to the point where you are angry enough, you're... you're uh, passionate enough that I'm going to go get that sucker and I'm going to make them pay for that I'm, I'm you know you, you see it on the news all the time I mean that's the kind of stuff that seems like it's going on a lot on the other side of the world you know I mean they're actually going and killing people I mean what does it take to have that much hatred if you will to want to go persecute someone well, the answer is it takes a lot. I mean, you, you, I mean, we could spend the rest of our time just exploring the emotions and the deep feelings that come out of that person's heart that wants to hurt that person. It, it's not that I want to silence that person. I want to, I want to teach that person a lesson. I want to put that person in a position where he or she will never talk about that again, never promote it. In fact, I want them down on their knees confessing their new allegiance to my way of thinking. That's why you persecute someone. I mean, if you think about the, the, uh, the anatomy of persecuting, I mean, there's a lot there. Now think about this. What Paul is saying, and really Jesus said it already in the Sermon on the Mount, Look what Paul said. Bless that person that hates you enough, is so motivated enough that he wants you or she wants you down on your knees, totally confessing and buying into their way of thinking. Bless them. And see that word bless? It, 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 it's the, the, the Greek word from which we get the word eulogy. Been to a funeral lately? What's a eulogy? It's where someone stands up and says good things. It, 
Say good things. Bless means to speak well of this person that is persecuting you. Speaking well of them doesn't mean, oh, hey, I'm right. I'm sorry. They are right. I have the wrong view, world view. I've been making Jesus too much in my life, and they're right. I'm totally wrong. Not that, but there is, there is a blessing that I'm supposed to give. Now, this, this just doesn't make sense at all until you remember that this is all under the umbrella of verse 9. Go back up to verse 9. What, what, what is the big instruction in this paragraph? It is to love people unhypocritically. It is to have the right attitudes and actions, that unconditional love and, and, and goodwill, if you will, acceptance as much as could be accepted of this person that hates your guts. I mean, now that is quite a reaction, isn't it? That's quite a response. That person maybe that's a, that you work with, that person that maybe you live next door to, that person that maybe you are married to, that, that is just constantly seeking to needle and get even, and it's like you look at it and you know that there are forces at work here that are, that are deep, that need to be mined out. What Paul is saying, you need to love that person unhypocritically. Love them, bless them, and don't curse them. I mean, I, I, I think that he, he is, the, you know, the emphasis here is on what you say about them. It is so easy for us, with our mouth, to lower ourselves down to their level. That's radical, isn't it? It's radical to, to have that kind of response towards these people that really are so wrong. But they have taken so much issue with what we are saying, they don't want to just silence us, they want to hurt us. That's how you love that person. My response, your response to them is supposed to be very, very Christ-like. See, we're not here, and I'm going to say this today, and I'm going to say it even next week when we get over into chapter 13, and we're talking about just how do you be a good citizen. Uh, you know what? I'm not here to make sure that my, uh, how does the Bill of Rights start off? My in, unalienable rights are not treaded upon. I mean, how the Declaration of Independence start off? You know, all men are created, you know, with these rights, the pursuit of happiness, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. My, my number one goal, your number one goal, because I'm a citizen of heaven, you, if you've trusted Jesus Christ, are a citizen of heaven. Our goal is not to make sure we get all of our rights and they're never treaded upon. Our goal is to live as citizens of heaven. Now, does that mean we don't get involved with the government and try to make things and correct things? No, we do all we can. Fortunately, we're living in that kind of a world. This is next week's sermon, but I've just got to get it in here. But, you know, when you take away something from me or when you limit something from me, persecute me, you know, my goal is not supposed to be how can I get get at you how can I persecute you back my goal is to make sure you see in me the love of Christ I mean just picture and think about Jesus dying on the cross think about the the 30 minutes leading up to Jesus dying on the cross and how they prepared him for that crucifixion and how he responded what was one of the things he said he said father forgive them they don't know what they're doing he loved them well. Let's push on. Look at verse 15. Now again, we quote this verse all the time, but I want you to see 
where the specific context is. It is sandwiched between some instructions about how you handle persecution and verse 17, what you do with those feelings of revenge. So it's one thing for me to rejoice with you guys because I hope we're all on the same team. But here he is instructing me not just to be able to rejoice with you guys and you with me because we're all in the church. He's telling me I need to rejoice even with those people outside who might be persecuting me or potentially persecuting me. Those people outside who might be doing something to me that is so irritating. Verse 17, I want to do some evil back to them. So, okay, it's true. I'm supposed to rejoice with you. I'm supposed to weep with you. But that's actually not the primary application of this verse, okay? Verse 15. It's rejoicing with the bad guys. Not over their badness, but rejoicing with them as human beings might rejoice. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Now think about how mature you've got to be. Think about how safe and secure you've got to feel in your own skin. How confident you've got to be in your own relationship with Jesus Christ that you're going to go rejoice with someone. It, that is so hard. I have a hard time getting excited about the great things that go on in my brother's life or my sister's life or, or close friend's life. Because you know what I usually do? It's like, wow, that's so great. You got a new car. Why can't I have a new car? <laughs> you know, it's so great. Your kid made the honor roll. Why are my kids not on the honor roll? You know, we all, we all have that tendency inside of us to compare. Oh, I'm so thrilled for you to have that brand new house. And then we go back to our shack. And I'm irritated. Why isn't God blessing me with a brand new house? You know? But what is God saying? God is saying... <laughs> It, there, there is something when you can get yourself into someone else's life and be genuinely happy for them or genuinely sad for them. I mean, that is powerful. That is that, is that unhypocritical love. It, it, verse 16, it, I think it's just kind of continuing the thought. There, there is supposed to be this same mind I mean, I'm feeling what you're feeling. I'm thinking what you're thinking. Not, not adopting your air, not adopting your heresy. I'm just, I mean, as human beings, as, as people who have been created in the image of God, I'm, go, I'm going to step into your life. I'm not going to be haughty in my mind. I'm going to associate with the lowly. I'm not going to be wise in my own estimation. Well, the reason you got that cruddy thing going on in your life is because you did it so wrong. And it's so easy to think that we're immune or we're above. I'd never get that. I'd never get into that situation. You know, he deserves that. She deserves that. Well, if I raised my kids that way, I, I'd expect it to be that way, you know? You don't do that. That, that, that is the, this love that is unhypocritical, this genuine, authentic love that I'm supposed to be showing to people who potentially could persecute me, to people who potentially could do something that is so vile and so evil that I want to do it back to them. I'm supposed to rejoice with them. I'm supposed to weep with them. I'm supposed to, to get myself into their life and genuinely feel and think what they think as human beings, as people created in the image of God. See verse 17? He kind, of, he kind of slips, moves on. Okay, he's been talking about responses and he's still going to talk about responses. We're supposed to respond like Christ would respond. Like Christ said we should respond in the Sermon on the Mount. Like Christ illustrated a response on the hill of Calvary. But then he kind of focuses in specifically on this whole thing of justice. Now let me quickly say here, that what I wrote up there says, let God take care of the justice. You got to come next week to hear how one of the ways 
And one of the primary ways that God takes care of that justice, because verse chapter 13, the first seven verses are all about government. And he makes it very clear that God has put them in charge of enacting justice. But in our situation, personally, justice is in the hands of the Lord. It's up to God to settle the score. It's up to God to make things even. Even though I don't like that one bit because I want to twist the knife and make them feel the pain, help them feel just as small as they made me feel. I want to love them back with some real pain and suffering. And that's not what he's saying here. Look at verse 17. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Boy, there's a lot of exceptions there. Can't you see it? I mean, never anyone. Never pay back evil for evil. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. You know what? Even unbelievers who are thinking on a more mature level would never endorse revenge. Would never endorse. They'll, they'll endorse retaliation. I mean, one of the things that we still got going with our nation is, is that when something happens, we might retaliate, but hopefully it's a measured retaliation, but it's not revenge. We've been watching a, uh, a, a documentary on uh, Netflix on uh, the 9-11 thing. I think it's got four parts. We've watched two of them. It's really, really good, by the way. And, and you know, I, just going back and reliving all that stuff of what happened 20 years ago, I mean, it just kind of makes you angry. And I'm like, why didn't George get the nukes out and go bomb all those people in Afghanistan, Iran, and everywhere else. I mean, let's just level the place. You know, but no, there was a measured retaliation. Why? Because that's, that's, that's a godly thing. And so it's nice that our nation still has a few elements that are godly there, but that's government. This is talking about me personally. He's saying, never pay back evil for evil. I mean, even the unbelievers are smart enough to know that. Nobody respects the person that seeks revenge. Verse 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. I mean, I love that. Paul's acknowledging, hey, you know what? There's some people you are not going to be in sync with. But to the extent that it is in your corner be at peace with those people look at look at verse 19 never take your own revenge beloved but leave room for the wrath of God it's almost like he's saying something you take revenge okay God's going to sit this one out you sit this one out God will take care of it and you'd much rather leave it to God than to you Leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Think about that right there before we move on. I mean, God has the long view of history. I mean, we are so into immediate results. And one of the things I, I, I'm just amazed at when I read Scripture is how most of those people in Scripture had this really long view of life. I mean, even today, I sat in one of the equipping classes, and uh, Brian Murphy was talking about Nehemiah. I mean, he was talking about something that had occurred 150 years earlier, and Nehemiah was acting like it occurred last week. I mean, I don't even know what happened in this country 150 years ago. I do. I hardly, well, today I hardly even remember what happened last week. You know, I mean, we are so into immediate results. But you know what? God says, hey, I got this. 
I got this. You, you may not see this person coming to justice. You may never see it in this life. But vengeance is mine, God says. I will repay. Look, look at verse 20. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. That's the humane thing to do. They, they are created in the image of God. Yeah, they're unbelievers. Yeah, they're people that maybe have even persecuted you or even been motivated to persecute you. They're people that have done some kind of evil to you that you want to do some evil back to them. But if your enemy is hungry, treat them as this person who is created in the image of God. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. And then you know what the second half of that let me just tell you, nobody knows what that means. Okay, nobody knows what that means. And in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. You know, okay, some kind of idiom might have come from some Egyptian custom, might have been this, hey, you'll really make him feel guilty and ashamed, but, you know, I consulted like, you know, seven or eight commentaries, and uh, nobody really knows what it means, and if you've heard a sermon that says, oh, this is what it means... He, he wasn't accurate, okay? So just uh, nobody knows what it means. The thing that bothers me about it is most of us sit and focus on, what does that mean, this burning coals of fire? Does that mean I take some fire over to his house so his wood stove can get started on mine, you know? And we kind of forget this thing about being nice to the enemy, treating the enemy humane, humanely. If they're hungry, give them something to eat. If they're thirsty, treat them as this person who's been created in the image of God verse 21 do not overcome evil do not be overcome do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good and he could have just as easily said overcome evil with unhypocritical love let God take care of the justice. And like I said, chapter 13 goes on to tell us one of the ways God does take care of that justice. But here's your mission, here's my mission. For people in the church, people outside of the church, people that should be outside of the church, <laughs> love them unhypocritically. You know, if we had time... It would be good to go and look and see how David treated Saul. Maybe you remember that story. Saul was king, but he had totally disqualified himself, and God had made it clear, very clear God was in the process of removing Saul, and he had appointed David. He had anointed David. But how did David respond to Saul? He knew Saul was wicked he knew Saul was evil he knew Saul was not God's man but he treated him with the utmost of respect he treated him with that unconditional love and in 1 Samuel 24 I think it's verse 17 Saul kind of at one time came to his senses and realized you're more righteous than I am and I'm sure a bunch of people are around him saying, duh. Uh, you know what? That evil person in your life, they may never come to the realization like Saul did. Or if they do, they'll be like Saul. And they'll come to it, but tomorrow they'll be right back as hardened as they have been. Uh, you know what? How do you respond to them? Love. Love. That unconditional love. That unhypocritical love. It is that Christ-like love that is supposed to be lived out. You know, I think the world should regularly, regularly be shocked by our responses to the world. And you know, that's one of the things I think that even right now, we because things have gotten so intense in the last six months, couple years, one of the things we as believers really need to do is be on our toes. Because way too often, 
We've sunk down to the world's level and we've returned evil for evil. We've done the thing that has not been respected. We've sought revenge. We, we, we played ugly. They persecuted us. We persecuted them back. That's, that's not what Christ called us to. Hard passage. Very hard to apply. Because you're going to go to work tomorrow and there is someone there that, you know, maybe they're not persecuting you, but they got a lot of those feelings. And they'd love to twist that knife, bring you down, make you pay. You might go home today, right after church, and there's someone there that is in that kind of an antagonistic relationship with you. What is Paul saying? He's saying, go love that person unhypocritically. Vengeance is mine, God says. I'll take care of it. Your job is to love. Your job is to extend grace. Your job is to, is to patiently endure. Your job isn't here to... to you're, you're a citizen of heaven. Those are the rights that count, not the rights here. It's like the old song said, this world is not our home, we're just passing through. We're citizens of heaven who are here, and one of the things we should be doing is loving unhypocritically. Let's pray. I just want to give you a moment to, uh, you know, maybe, maybe the Holy Spirit uh, reminded you of someone or some situation. And it is particularly hard. It's really hard because every one of us want to make people pay. It's just wired into us. And maybe there's someone you would just love to give them a piece of your mind. Maybe there's someone you'd love to just hurt them as much as they've hurt you. Uh, right now, ask God to give you that ability to let love be without hypocrisy. To cling to what is good and hate the evil that is inside each of us. Father, we ask for help today. We want to be light. We want to be salt. And Father, we, we just recognize that uh, this is one area where Satan would love to bring us down to reduce us to being people who, even though we're regenerated by the blood of Jesus Christ, redeemed from the curse of the law, we act just like unbelievers. We talk like them. We react like them. We curse like them. We seek to get vengeance like them. Father, help us not to go there. I pray that in a very real way you would give us that inner fortitude to love like Jesus Christ loved. Here in the church and outside the church. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.